on behalf of Usha Mittal Institute of Technology, SNDT Women's University, the Alumina Council of UMIT, and WAVE, I would like to welcome all our participants for the webinar on people, AI, and robots. I would also like to welcome our panelist, Mr. Nishad Mehre, our guest speaker for today, Dr. Sanjay Shitore, Head of the Department, Information Technology, UMIT SNDT Women's University, and our moderator from WAVE, Ms. Vanita Shanmukam. In these uncertain times, to leave a legacy of knowledge and stability for the coming generation, we would need to have some thrust areas for a robust tomorrow. One such area is automation. To understand this in detail, we have with us Mr. Nishad Mehre. He is Systems and Automation Manager at AGL Energy Limited Australia. Mr. Nishad has worked in telecom, media, utilities domain, undertaking various roles with major organizations across India, UK and Australia for over 11 years now. He specializes in robotics and artificial intelligence and has previous working worked in billing, fraud, prevention and revenue assurance related programs. His current role includes managing a team that uses robotics, AI, and analytics as a part of the business automation strategy that will support the broader operation at AGL Energy. With us today, we have from Usha Mittal Institute of Technology, Dr. Sanjay Shipore, who is the head of the department and associate professor in the Department of Information Technology. He has earned his PhD from IIT Bombay he has over 20 years of teaching experience. Recently, he successfully completed an online course learning how to learn powerful mental tools to help your, you master tough subjects offered by the University of California. He has presented his research ideas in international conferences and workshops held in Melbourne, Australia, and Italy. He's also a re recipient of an award for his research paper from Indian Society of Remote Sensing. He has conducted talks on various topics such as machine learning, image processing, remote sensing, and open source software at various universities and institutes. He is principal investigator for research project NISAR on machine learning funded by NASA and ISRO. I welcome you all and I would now call upon Mr. Nishad to start the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sanchali, and um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to be um, to be able to present today and, and talk about people, AI, and robots. Uh, I know most of you might be attending a few webinars um, in this time, so I try and keep uh, the webinars as interesting and, as possible. So um, I promise you guys that I'll not be using COVID or coronavirus more than once in the whole seminar, because I think we've heard enough of that already. So um, I will begin by just uh, just want to tell you guys what we'll cover today. So we'll go, we'll cover why future is here. So I think um, there's quite a few things that have happened in the recent past, which almost are you know pointing to a fact that whatever we expected to happen in the new future is already happening and it's all around us. I'll talk briefly about software robot. Um, I'll talk about why the combination of software robot with machine learning and AI is for the win and, and really uh, the best uh, that we have had so far in terms of automation and the scale that we get. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how you can identify real world um, use cases for implementation of either software robots or AI or a combination of both. And then lastly, I'll speak about the career opportunities that exist in this field. Um, in terms of you know uh, various roles that are available because um, i think automation always comes with a fear of losing you know people losing their jobs so i think um, i'll just try and address that a bit at the end all right so um pre covid um we have already seen quite a few things that have happened in terms of the progress that we have made, not just in terms of automation, but even artificial intelligence. Um, I've tried to give a few examples on the screen there. So uh, you can see there's been a lot of emphasis on physical robots and, and obviously, um, you know, 
there's some uh, level of AI and, and machine learning that has been utilized primarily by the larger software organizations uh, like Facebook, Amazon, Google, um, and Apple. Uh, I think there's, if you look at um, the current scenario that we live in, there's automation and AI across everything that we use, right from your phone, Amazon, Alexa's of, of the world. I think everything is already embedded to be able to help us feel like pretty much the future is here. Uh, I think growing up, we've always just thought about all these things that would happen in the future, but we can already see them happening. So I think that's already been a part of the journey that we have covered so far. And I think it just emphasizes the fact that that, that part of the journey is already you know, completed. Uh, what COVID did essentially is almost fast track the digital strategy and the implementation for the entire world, not just one or two organizations, but you can see the kind of advances or the, the kind of uh, you know innovations that we have now embraced in such a short time um, it, it is phenomenal. I've just tried to give some examples in terms of why um, I know, you know, um, COVID has actually been um, one of the biggest influencers for the digital transformation program. I've got a few examples there. One of them is obviously the, the education system that has changed because of uh, COVID, uh, kids not being able to go to school. So it's all remote learning, remote working. Um, organizations have adapted remote working. Um, one of the things that Forbes pointed out was manufacturing industry will actually experience five years worth of innovation just in 18 months. So I think the kind of pace that COVID has given us is pretty phenomenal. Uh, I think that's the positive side of COVID, to be honest. I think, um, uh, and, and one more example I've given there is at an aged care, there's a physical robot that's actually helping um, you know, people at the aged care facility com to communicate with, uh, with their family members, with relatives and so on, they don't really have access to mobile and they're not really allowed to have that. So I think that also gives them a bit of a human element because that robot pretty much moves around. So I think uh, the fact is that we are already living in the future that we all dreamt of. So I think that's been always the case. Uh, we've always seen that through just the physical aspect of automation in most of the cases there is an aspect of automation that sort of resides in the background that we don't really always get exposure to. But I think what we have so far seen is that we have always just looked at automation when you can actually feel or see something. But there's also a you know another type of digital beings that exist and they've lived with us for some time now. Uh, and those are the ones that are called software robots. In today's world, they're called um, software robots are primarily known as robotics process automation tools. Uh, now, what robotic process automation tools is, it's, it's essentially a technology or a product that helps you mimic user actions or interactions that you uh, humans have with core systems, web applications, desktop applications. It's very non-invasive. Um, you don't really need to have a very large infrastructure implementation for uh, these tools to be Im implemented. Um, you can begin with very simple uh, rule-based tasks and then scale to more sophisticated algorithms or processes. Uh, one thing that is very important to note about these uh, RPA tools is that they are not inherently intelligent. So they can't make the decision of what is the next step to perform on their own. All those steps that they have to perform will have to be embedded and coded into the tool so that it can actually perform that. I'll probably try and give you an example of a process um, consider a billing account creation for a customer or even a mobile account creation. So let's say you sign up with Airtel or Vodafone and when you sign up with them, they have, they get all your details in a form or, you know, you sign up online and then there's a billing account that gets created in your name. Now, typically, uh, you know, so far we have seen that once, uh, you know, that customer form is submitted, someone will take that form, fill up the application on a CRM uh, tool that they use, and then the billing account will be created. Um, you can think of RPA or software robot as something like once you receive that form from the customer, let's say via email, there'll be a robot that will log on to that email. Um, it'll look for that email subject, it will look for that form, and then it will extract all the information from the form on its, on its own. It will log into the CRM. It'll create all the, uh, you know, it'll complete all the fields that it needs to for creating a billing account. 
and it will go through all the validations and checks a user would go through and at the end of it it will create a billing account just as a user would have created manually um and that's very seamless it's not something that requires a lot of intervention there are different types of rp available but i think there are some where you don't really need any intervention at all and it's quite capable of handling quite a few scenarios so as long as you know that the process is mature uh it's it's robust enough and and we know all the possibilities in that uh, process it is pretty easy to automate that i've just mentioned uh, uh the quadrant from um gartner which talks about all the rpa tools that are available in the market right now there's quite a few uh, one thing that's very specific about these software robot tools is that they are most of them i think 95% of them are all windows platform based you don't really have any rpa tools in the market right now which are for open source there's one or two which are currently coming up but then not up to the mark in terms of the you know the kind of capability that they provide in comparison to the windows based ones um there's been a lot of debate around who actually invented these software robots um there's this company called blue prism which is you can see uh, in the leader space there they say that they've been you know they invented that in 2005 uh, pega systems which owns a tool called openspan they seem to think that they have been the owners of it so there's it's a bit of a controversy in terms of who started it but now that it's so prevalent there's these tools that are available in the market now um when when you look at any any of these tools more or less they provide the same level of you know um capabilities or skills so i'll just talk very briefly about what you can do using these tools uh, and what are the key features in in these tools now you can consider um let's say for um in in a normal working scenario you would have a person who would be working 8 hours a day and they will be working on a very specific area or a very specific domain um you can think of rpa as a digital employee so so software robot is essentially your digital employee you can program them to perform exactly similar functions that a normal employee would as long as the process is well defined in order to help you execute those processes they've got a central dashboard kind of a thing within the tool itself so let's say you've got 10 licenses on which you can run 10 concurrent processes you can use this central dashboard to view all those 10 licenses and what is actually being run on those 10 licenses at that time you could have one robot license running a billing account creation process you could have another one just categorizing emails you could have another one really looking at a very different problem statement um these tools essentially all these software robots are very good with identifying elements on the screen if they change minutely so um to be honest with you i think if you look at um how these robots perform any action um and if you're just purely looking at the screen when the robot is going through everything you can't really differentiate whether it's a human doing it or a robot doing it so they exactly follow the same flow they will log in to an application they'll click on the right buttons they'll uh, you know enter information in the fields um so when you look at just the desktop or the screen you will not be able to differentiate whether it's a user performing it or a robot performing it um and like a user if let's say the search box moves from you know top left corner to the top right corner we can figure that out that the search box has moved these robots also can figure out that the search box has moved from let's say top left to top right and they can actually um you know use that new location to click on search they are capable of performing optical character recognition which is something that's really interesting because quite a few uh, organizations have struggled with digitization of information so you get uh, printed information or pdf documents and these robots let you extract information from those documents and they can then be converted into more structured information uh, these can be easily scaled and are flexible uh let's say uh for example what what i mean by that is tomorrow all of a sudden uh, you get 10000 customers signing up for an offer that um let's say if you are a telco if you are offering a new plan you've got 10000 customers who all of a sudden sign up and we have to obviously fulfill all of those customers what you can do is if you have a a robot that is programmed to really look at billing account creation for example you could deploy deploy that process package that you have created 
on all the robot licenses that you've got in your organization. And what that will do is you can split the entire volume of 10,000 customers across those licenses and they can concurrently work through those 10,000 so that you can get through that you know, larger volume in a very short amount of time. Compare that to somebody having to actually go through all of those applications manually and, and you know, uh, entering all that information into CRM. Typically, most of these robots are, um, at least in my experience, I've seen that they're at least 40% more faster than what a user would, you know. So I might make a typo when I'm typing something. I might be actually clicking the wrong button. I might take a coffee break. I might go on leave. But these robots work 24-7. So essentially, they give you uh, 24 hours of, you know, time that you can spend on actually processing some information in comparison to, you know, a normal shift of eight to nine hours that a user would be doing. So that that gives you that, uh, gives you that flexibility of actually executing processes around the clock. I've just mentioned some of these cap the capabilities, and that's not an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to give you an example of uh, what these software robots can do. They can log into multiple applications concurrently. They can create, modify Excel, Word documents. They can perform simple calculations. They can open emails, reply to emails. They can open email attachments, make sense of those email attachments. They can follow a scenario or decision based, you know, a flow. Uh, they can screen scrape information. So let's say you've got three applications that your organization or your, you know, university uses, and you need to be able to fetch information from one and put that into another. These robots can do that. So these are just some of the things that I mentioned. Why? Because I think these sort of form the basic steps of any process that you look at in terms of any, uh, you know, automation or, or any business process. Um, I have got one example of a process that has been automated purely using just the RPA tool. Uh, whatever I've spoken so far, uh, all these capabilities and all of this, this is purely plain software robot. None of this is machine learning. None of this is AI. This is purely software robot, who, uh, which are capable of handling structured or semi-structured information. They're capable of automating, you know, semi, uh, sorry, they're capable of automating mature robust processes and, and they will completely be, you know, seamless in terms of execution. You can have manual interventions. You can have uh, steps in there where they hand over, you know, some steps to a user and uh, the user can then hand, hand back that process to the robot again after performing some steps in between. So what I'll do now is I'll just play a video which actually shows, shows you guys one of the robots that is going to be posting and processing invoices in SAP. In this video, we'll show you how UiPath streamlines an invoice process end to end. You are about to see a robot performing the following activities. Monitoring a dedicated folder where invoices are saved in PDF format. Reading invoices from that folder one by one. Extracting key information from the invoices. Opening SAP. Filling in invoice details in SAP. Sending email notifications. Please note that the robot will do some activities in the background, such as most of the invoice related actions, monitoring a folder or checking its email address. Now let's see it working. Right now, it's monitoring a folder where three invoices are stored and collecting all the information needed so it can register them one by one. It then asks the tester to introduce the email address where the posting notification will be sent and also performs basic checks to see if the SAP is open and runs it on its own if not. Logging into SAP using its credentials, it then starts processing the invoices one by one. We can see it filling in data such as vendor code, invoice date, invoice number, invoice amount, invoice description, and GL account, and ends up by filling the payment term. Following that, it registers the remaining two invoices in the assigned company code. A 
An email containing the SAP registration number is sent automatically by the robot after successfully registering each invoice. Checking in the background, the robot verifies whether the VAT on the invoice matches the one in our database, and if so, will post it automatically. Otherwise, it will park it and send a dedicated email to the responsible person highlighting this difference and asking what to do. Post the invoice or to cancel it and send it back to the vendor. All the invoice's details are visible in the email it sends, so let's reply with yes to the message for an invoice with a VAT difference. Finally, it will check its email address in the background, access SAP using the appropriate transaction code, and post the invoice. And that's it. The robot has successfully posted the three invoices in SAP. So that essentially showed you guys what um, the robot can do in, in this particular example of invoice processing. Now, like I said earlier, if you're looking just at the screen or the desktop, you can't really differentiate whether it's a, it's a user performing those actions or a software robot. You could see that for some of those invoices where it followed um, you know, all the rules that were defined in that process, one of which was verifying whether the VAT on the invoice matches the VAT that we have configured in the system. Wherever it was you know, matching, it posted those uh, invoices automatically. There was one invoice where it was different uh, you know, to the one that they had configured in the system. So that VAT difference was something that it sent to a person via email to say, hey, there's this invoice that I've got. Uh, where I can see that there's difference in, in the VAT that is available on the system versus to what I've got in the invoice. Now, even decoding all the information from the invoice was something that the bot did on its own. So when it asked the user to confirm whether should I post that invoice or not, the user replied saying yes. Once it replied saying yes, uh, what this robot is capable of doing is ca it can check email over and over again, every second, every minute, you can schedule it to check that. Uh, when it got a response from the user to say yes, post it, uh, it took that response back into SAP and posted that third invoice of successfully. So this is purely just software robot without any intelligence involved. This is purely a rule or decision-based flow that we have tried to you know, uh, trace. Um, a user would have done the same thing, essentially. Um, the only difference would have been that the user would have made that decision on the spot whether to post it or not. In this case, because there was a difference, the robot just asked for that. Uh, once it got that confirmation back from the user, um, it posted that invoice. Um, sorry. Um, so now I'm just going to talk very briefly about um, how software robots combined with machine learning or artificial intelligence, intelligence sort of give you um, the level of process coverage that you, I mean, I mean, uh, frankly, three, four years ago, I wouldn't have really imagined that the process coverage would be so vast. So first of all, there's two kinds of um, software robots that are available. One is the attended RPA robots, and the other one is the unattended RPA robots. Attended RPA robots require, uh, or you can program these robots to actually be run on uh, the user's machine. So let's say you've got um, an accountant who's working through things. You can program these robots to run on those machines itself. The reason for these to be run on those machines is that there will be one or two steps, intermediate uh, you know, steps, or maybe uh, the first step itself, which requires a manual intervention or the user has to invoke that. These are well suited for you know, well-defined mature processes with structured or semi-structured data. The second a slightly advanced uh, software robot is unattended RPA. And these are self-triggered or event-driven, or, or you can schedule them to run. There is absolutely no manual intervention required. So you can run these robots potentially in the cloud environment. You don't really need to even have them on a user desktop. What you can do is, um, when I think about event-driven uh, triggers, um, essentially um, you know, check the email uh, mailbox for a new email with a subject line XYZ. So if that email arrives, then perform the next set of actions. So that itself is a trigger and you can program the bot to actually 
um, you know, identify the trigger and then carry out the next actions that are, you know, in flow. Machine learning. Now, I think machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's always a, a side of a slightly similarity and, and, you know, difference that people can't always see. Uh, machine learning essentially helps you uh, train an algorithm uh, using structured, unstructured, semi-structured data to really identify patterns or recognize patterns <coughs> Sorry, and data points to categorize information in a particular manner. So what you can do is you can essentially look at machine learning being a part or, or embedded within the RPA tool and then... Um, the combination itself is what will give you artificial artificial intelligent product. Um, now, there's quite a few instances where these you know new vendors that have products in the market, they've started calling artificial intelligence by different names now. So they call some of them call it intelligent automation, some of them call it intelligent process automation. Essentially, artificial intelligence or the other two things that I just mentioned, they mean the same thing. What we are doing as a part of that is we are actually integrating a simple um, non-intelligent robot, the software bot, and we are integrating that with the, the algorithm that we get in, through machine learning. All the cate categorization or you know pattern recognition that the machine learning algorithm can do, it will then drive decisions back into RPA. So for example, if you look at that invoice processing scenario that I, we just watched on the video, where it actually looked for uh, you know, that difference and sent that email out to a user, what machine learning will do is it will actually gather information for all the emails that this robot has sent over, over the last three months, six months, 12 months, and it will try and identify for a wide difference of 5%, did the user say yes? For a wide difference of 10%, did the user say no or yes? And then it will you know, learn on its own to then prompt a decision back to the robot rather than sending that email out to the user. It will essentially take that decision on its own based on all the data that it has available. And it will process the third invoice on its own rather than asking the user for it. Now, the, the you know as you move to from attended RPA to you know an artificial intelligent or smart um, you know process um, implementation, the level of coverage that you can uh, you know get from a process coverage perspective increases significantly. Now, throughout all the processes that I've been implemented in in you know in the roles that I've been, uh, we've been able to get an average of eighty three percent process coverage. When I say eighty three percent average, what I mean is that for a process as simple as even invoice processing or billing account creation, there might be deviation or there might be errors that it can come to. So one of them could be the form is not absolutely accurate and correctly printed or the PDF is not clear. Will your machine learning algorithm or your OCR or optical character recognition engine be able to extract all the information? If it can't, and if there are some fields missing, you're going to have a business exception. You're going to have you know, some error that will not let you perform or complete that transaction. Uh, how do you deal with that? How do you really try and understand if there's some bit which is unclear, will your machine learning algorithm be able to tell you that unclear bit, whether it's a date of birth, whether it's, you know, anything that might be, you know, unclear in the form, can it recognize that based on very small data points because it has access to this huge data, in, uh, you know, information from the last three to six months? All that combined helps you cover the process and the scenarios that we see or, you know, um, that, that process presents and, and really lets you seamlessly perform that process through automation end to end, right from that email coming to your mailbox to creation of that billing account and then an SMS being sent to a customer as well, informing them that your billing account is now created. You will be connected on this new network by, you know, in four hours time or whatever that might be. So, so I think that whole process coverage that you get through software robot com combined with machine learning or AI, it's pretty phenomenal in terms of, you know, um, the kind of execution that you can perform through it. Um, now, I just want to talk very briefly about how can you identify use cases for software robots on their own and intelligent automation separately as well. Um, 
what this essentially helps us do is rp or software robots you can like i said uh, there are very specific steps or there are very specific scenarios where this will be really useful um most of those scenarios are going to be where you don't have to take any decision outside the system any decision that is going to be taken is within the system itself or there are very clear rules that are defined to really make any decision when you go from point a to point b so um typically um people look at implementing software robots when there's a very high volume of that transaction or that account uh, you know uh, processing that needs to happen um for example like i said billing account creation is uh, the example that i'll keep coming back to if you've got multiple instances where you've got 10 people who are just doing that activity in your organization that means it's very high frequency you've got more volume coming in for that particular task you might look at even billing payments uh, or posting of invoices as another one so any such tasks which have very high volume in the organization and are very you know um, very much uh, rule based or they are very much predictable in terms of what are the actions that you need to take on them they will be something that um, software robots will be very effective for comprising of avoidable errors now as users or as humans we make uh, you know typos while typing into uh, you know names any fields that we might get um there can be other avoidable errors as well you might be not on the right screen you might be on a very different screen all these errors can be avoided because we know that they are very simple to understand or identify so as long as we know that those errors are avoidable that can also be a characteristic that you can take into consideration while thinking about whether you can implement a, a robot or not high process productivity um again very simple similar to avoid avoidable errors you know what exactly you're look, looking to do in that process billing account creation has to happen based on name date of birth address passport id or aadhar card id or something like that and then as long as all that information is available credit checks are passed you can uh, you know um, create that billing account it's a very straightforward flow and it's very predictable if one of those information is not valid if one of those information is missing you can't create the billing account so um that and repetitive so um i think high frequency and repetitiveness sort of go hand in hand so if you've got too much volume coming you obviously will have to perform the same thing over and over and over again any scenario like that uh will classify for you know a better implementation or a better output through soft software robots where you will get efficiency you will get time back uh, whoever was doing this manually will be able to do something more value add uh, activities rather than performing these mundane repetitive tasks now one of the things that sort of get missed uh, gets missed most of the time is that um most of these organizations or you know any of these processes are being done over time for 10 years the the exact same way that they were so someone defined the process in 2010 we are doing it the same way in 2020 uh, what is actually useful to do is that when you're tr- trying to identify these characteristics that you know will help you understand whether it's a uh, you know good use case for software robot or not don't just look at the process in its current shape or form or as the, uh, you know the as is process as it stands look at it in terms of can i tweak this process a bit can i change some things can i maybe change the sequence and then the, these characteristics will come through so there's always a to be part of the process that you can look at desi- designing before you look for these parameters or these characteristics and then you can use a software robot to actually automate that entire process so that's about rpo software robots in the ai or intelligent automation landscape um i personally look at that as an extension of software robots in a way because um you will be able to disqualify a process based on some things that don't fit the criteria for software robot uh, what are those characteristics if the data is unstructured if the the process is highly unpredictable what do i do in such cases i can't automate that using just the software robot what do i need to do then is i need to understand the predictability patterns a bit more uh, can i look at a machine learning algorithm then uh, what i'll need to do is i'll need to actually speak to the business expert so if you are somebody who is building or developing these robots or or looking at the ai solution for it you'll always need 
the understanding of the domain uh, and and the business expertise so that person who has that domain or business expertise he will he or she will be able to tell you what is that overall problem statement what are the kind of uh, you know possibilities that exist and what can help you get more data points so that you can make that decision based on those patterns and those predictions um what's already being done uh, is that we know what ai is capable of um and you know that business problem so wherever you see that uh, there's a you know perfect match of those two things coming through those are the you know use cases where you can look at artificial intelligence in terms of implementation now i've just tried to give some of the scenarios where ai sort of comes into picture classification or association think of it this way uh, you get 10000 emails in a mailbox and those 10000 emails need to be allocated to different users based on the context on those emails now if i were to read those emails one by one and then allocate them to you know these people who need to look at that it will take lots and lots of time think of a machine learning algorithm which will work on some emails from the past and the in the decisions that a user had made to then automatically classify these emails that this email needs to go to billing this email needs to go to complaints this email needs to go to payments and so on purely by reading the text within the email to take that decision and 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 you know forward that or move that email to the right team grouping uh, very similar to classification as an association if you have got 10 invoices from the same company coming through uh, over the last 12 months how do you group them together the format of that invoice is going to be same so how do you identify that format if i am a user i will obviously open every invoice and go through that information and there's a very specific you know pattern that we, i'll be able to recognize you can use ai or machine learning algorithm to recognize those patterns and group them together image extraction and understanding again similar to invoice process uh, invoice example that i gave you uh, there might be photos that you get there might be you know pdf files that you get some users might just send you um, you know the photo of the passport um using their mobile phone can you extract information uh, of from the passport purely using that photo yes natural language processing is the sentimental analysis so chatbots virtual robots sorry um virtual chat assistants all these are the ones that you uh, you know you can build using natural language processing uh, and and they let you understand what the user is talking about what are they really looking for in 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 their queries and and most of the chatbots actually are based on natural language processing voice and speech understanding is almost an extension of natural language processing itself where you can try and identify uh, through the voice and speech of the user uh, what they are looking for maybe convert that to text for uh, effective decision making and essentially all these elements that we just talked about can feed into a software robot for it to make the decision and you know act on it on its own um for example chatbot um if a user wants to activate roaming for the custom uh, for on their mobile phone um you will have uh, the user talking to a you know a chatbot and say i want to activate roaming uh, the chatbot will actually understand that using natural language processing that the user is looking to activate roaming uh, once it understands that it could send that information to a software robot which is actually capable of just actioning activation of roaming in the crm system it will pass that information on to that software robot it will take that action pass it back and on to the chatbot to say this has been completed and the chatbot could go, go back to the user and say this is done now so i think if you look at these two um you know technologies or these solutions they are almost complementing each other or supplementing each other when you're trying to solve a process in a real world scenario um and lastly um i think um career opportunities is something that obviously we all want to be aware of um in terms of automation or any kind of um, industrial revolution that we have been through there's always been fear of automation that it will lead to you know loss of jobs um a lot of people thought when software robots came into existence uh, maybe let me take a step back a lot of people when uh, thought when computers came into existence that computers are so smart they are going to be doing everything and will not have jobs was that true no because you had to actually you know operate those computers on your own really build some things and and you know uh, then that's when the computers became effective and useful they helped you with simplification of a process 
very similar to that, all these software robots or AI and all these elements are still going to require some sort of human uh, touch to it. We cannot take away the, you know, the intelligence that in, uh, humans bring uh, completely, purely replace that with AI. That's not possible, at least of, you know, as of now. So what are the kind of opportunities that are, you know, um, available or that can be, uh, you know, um, available for, for anybody who's looking at automation as a domain? You've got roles within the delivery lifecycle. Process mining and data mining to actually help you identify the use cases and processes that you would want to automate. That on its own is a, is a job area that currently exists. Business unit operational management roles. So all these software robots, they will be running in the background. They might be running um, at a certain time uh, or you know, a certain point of time. There are roles that are related to monitoring them, making sure that they, they are you know, uh, all um, working as expected as per the schedule, fixing normal, nominal errors or you know, issues that you might have with those and reporting on type, uh, you know, on, on those user, uh, on, on those robots and, and, you know, stuff like that. That's also a kind of role that's available. If you're into development or coding, there's also certification available for all these RPA tools. Most of these RPA tools have their own academy um, that's free. They've got community edition uh, software licenses. So UiPath, Blue Prism, Automation Anywhere, they all have a community edition. You can literally download that. They've got information uh, that you can refer to and really start learning and get the certification done. Um, and very similar to that, there are also AI, um, you know, technologies. You can get NLP certification through Microsoft q &A framework. You can get it from Amazon. There's quite a few, um, you know, companies who offer that. And there are obviously the last one is the leadership opportunities, um, which sort of forms the, you know, basis of any software or IT delivery lifecycle. You always have to have people who lead the project or program, um, you know, Agile is probably the new thing. Uh, Lean Six Sigma is another, where these people will be able to use those principles to define the delivery life cycle and the governance framework that you need in order to automate these processes, in order to deliver these programs and in order to, you know, execute them seamlessly and report on that. Um, so I think these are the kind of career opportunities that currently exist and these are evolving. So, you know, um, what I learned for, uh, you know, in, term, in robotics and AI four years ago is not entirely relevant right now because quite a few, few, few of those things are now coming embedded in the tools, are coming embedded in the solutions that we're looking at. So you have to think, think a step ahead and, and really think about now that this is available in the tool, what more can I do with it? So there'll, there'll be, you know, more evolutions happening. This is definitely not the end of, you know, automation. This is probably a stepping stone in terms of where we are headed. So there'll be more roles available in the future, but these are kind of four categories you currently have roles available in. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much, Nisar, uh, sir. This indeed is a wonderful presentation. Moving on to the Q&A session, I would like to read a few questions we received from our students. The first one is from Neha. Can we add process parameter, power consumption detail integrated with SAP through this robot software and how? Yeah, so I think um, the answer to that question is yes. We can add process parameters in there. We can add rules and specific information with regards to reading and, you know, um, you know how much uh, are we charging for each of the, uh, the, you know, if it's power consumption, I'm, I'm, think, I'm guessing you're talking about energy or gas consumption. So um, you could also look at whether the invoice is accurate to to the, the to the you know in terms of the usage that is currently on that invoice. So you can add those parameters as well. All those checks are look. Uh, I think all those checks are still based on fixed parameters and they are predictable. So um, if you think that for a hundred kilowatt of usage or power consumption, you should be charged two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars, is that actually matching that? Um, you can add those rules and you can even build exceptions based on that. Uh, and, and that's possible. Okay. This question is from Sanjay. Is there any chance that the app developer can steal personal data of the companies by his cloud software? Um, look, I think hacking is something that, or cybersecurity is something that's completely um, sort of... Uh, 
a different area uh, whether a robot can be programmed to do that yes um, again um, stealing information or or anything if you look at it at its core that's a process in itself even a hacker when they log in to or, or perform certain steps they try and do that on their own manually you could actually program a bot to do that um and and that's been done in the past in quite a few scenarios uh, scenarios and situations so that's definitely possible okay this one is from sushant how can we integrate this software with scada and hmi skid post integration can we use sap software for data and process mining um so um apologies i don't know scar and nhmid um to to its t but i can tell you that in the in the integration of sap uh to get the process mining and 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 you know the data from it it's possible um you have to think of it um as you know how far can you take the the coverage of the process and the level of uh, you know um coverage that you want for a process um and this is something that actually um you know um helps you understand that when you look at a particular process in isolation there might be 10 step that you have to perform as a part of that process but there might always be pre and post um you know core process steps that can also be included because quite a few times uh, there's a few uh, you know nominal activities that we do uh, that we don't think about publishing a report could be one sending an email could be another uh, you know all these things which happen post a core process they can also be a part of the scope as long as you have a very defined flow and and you know rules to really uh, govern that automated flow so so that is definitely possible okay uh, yeah sorry to disturb uh, if we could uh, stop the presentation and uh, we can have mr nishad then oh, uh, sanjay sir yeah. uh, Yeah yeah as a Let part of yeah question yep. answers please yeah thanks yep. no worries so, this question is on artificial intelligence and research project how to mm-hmm. learn practical skills of various subsets of ai like ml and incorporate them into a meaningful research project uh look like i said earlier um ai and ml is very prevalent and you've got pretty much uh, examples of it across you know the things that you use uh, on a daily basis starting from your phone um if you want to really look at um a very simple understanding of ml and ai i'll suggest maybe python is one thing that you could start with it's open source it's av- there's plenty of material available for python there's quite a few algorithms that are available online that you can try and replicate um and really look at the problem statements that you currently are facing or or let's say even the mobile phone or alexa or amazon um you know or or google are actually helping you solve are you able to replicate that sol- solution in some shape or form using you know these tools or technologies and really try and address that whether you know um it's possible to do that and 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 really use that to understand how far you can take a particular technology um in in terms of trying to solve that problem for you it may not be possible just using one particular tool or one particular technology it might be a mixture of two or three different tools uh, just try and understand whether uh, you know let's say python will solve uh, part a of the solution uh, a problem um, software robot might solve part b of it and then in in its in its entirety you could actually have that Uh, you know something that you could use for real life examples and and you know uh, projects uh, that you currently might be working through yeah i would uh, also like to know if uh, sir would like to add anything in this since his area of expertise also nlp and machine learning uh, no thank you finally i will conclude it uh, nishad gave the perfect uh, answer for that also okay thank you so this one is on higher education what are the ways to adopt ai in higher education part uh look i think um if i'm if i'm being honest i think um there's um there's applications of it you, that you you know it it's un- ultimately your imagination how you can take how far you can take that uh in education essentially there's quite a few solutions that are already available uh with regards to you know um user behavior student behavior teacher behavior there's quite a few modules that are available um 
there are countries where they are used to really govern or monitor uh, classrooms so that's one aspect of it which is probably going to be beneficial for the the university or the school or the education institute that's running that for students you could actually look at that as can i use this information and compare what i've been taught in the class uh, you know um, with something that's available online or the prevalence of it or the relevance of it and i think there's um i wouldn't probably say that there's there's a, a certain use case that i can think of um, Unfortunately, I'm I'm not somebody who has worked into I the can, education uh, line. So I much. can uh, so maybe add. Sanjay sir can probably. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I can add yeah. uh, into this one. In the higher education, machine learning and artificial intelligence plays a role. Since uh, that means I know the first time uh, I learned about it in the 2004, uh, I saw that uh, one professor from the MIT uh, gave the software. Uh, that is for the adaptive learning, based upon learners' background, learners' knowledge. course material will be provided and its examination will happen online and accelerated degrees will be uh, were given and nowadays personalized learning is happening a lot then uh, ana- learning analytics is happening a lot and based upon users experience uh, learning material is provided to the user uh, that is the very very uh, what you can say the appealing uh, application of uh, ai and machine learning for the, in the higher education yes i have completed Okay, sir. Thank you, Sanjay sir. Mm-hmm. So there is one question from Sanjay, sir. Can you tell me in which all areas we can use effectively robot software automation? Um. So, to be honest, I think there's not a single area where it cannot be used. So you can think of banking, fraud, telco, um, utilities. any area where there is a, a manual process that needs to be performed on software applications or desktop applications or web applications all those areas can be uh, you know areas where software uh, robots can be used um and like i said it is ultimately a business process right so someone has had to do that manually in the past um and as long as it's a very mature and robust process um you can just think of implementing a software robot to mim- mimic or imitate that process and complete that for us so there's hardly any area where it's not possible when it comes to the world of softwares to use these software robots okay so the next question what is the role of ai in data mining look i think um there's quite a few things that have happened in the recent past when it comes to data mining uh, one of them is user behavior um i think user behavior is something that uh, helps you understand what the user is actually looking for or what's relevant for the user when you're looking for something consider the example of amazon um, as a shopping website when you search for a particular you know um, item that you want to buy you get suggestions as to the customer who purchased this product were also you know looking for 10 other products that appear at the bottom um how does that work um these are the things that are identified using um you know ai or machine learning algorithms that amazon employs when it's looking to gather information uh, or you know from from user behavior so that is essentially a form of data mining that they are trying to do in order to promote some of the products that the customer might actually find useful to get there um youtube google search is very similar to that if you search for something 2 years ago or even yesterday or or in in the current situation if you're talking about something and and uh, you know you've got your phone beside you essentially google prompts you with results instagram or facebook prompt you with those results all these are forms of data mining because what they're doing is uh, your speech and your you know um, the conversation that you're having they're able to capture that and really um, show results which are prevalent or relevant to that particular uh, you know uh, discussion or conversation if i talk about dubai right now i'll probably get suggestions on trip to trips to dubai and what are the things that are you know um um you can look at or visit places in in dubai um in the next moment um on my phone or instagram uh, or facebook so all these examples are actually uh, where we can see artificial intelligence intelligence or machine learning playing a role in data mining 
one more question on masters i want to pursue masters in robotics and automation should i do it from india or abroad if abroad what countries you would suggest um in interesting question so look i think um more than the um the country or the university that you'd be looking at i think what will probably be good to understand is a are you actually looking at it as um as a move from from you know if your basis is computer science you could actually like i said there's plenty of information available on these tools um that are you know um classified as community editions uh, this certification and all of that available if you are really looking to do masters there's quite a few universities which are coming up with these courses uh, but i would recommend if i were you i would probably look at a few um executive courses or or diploma courses that um i think there's there's a couple of universities in japan that are offering that uh, and trust me the reason i say that is because uh japan was some uh, a country where software robots actually entered pretty much towards the end but the kind of development uh, that they have been able to do using software robots is phenomenal they've actually beaten every other country who had the exposure to these software robots in the past 5 uh, 6 years and they've been actually able to you know deliver or and develop things on their own um very easily um um using the software robots in the last 2 years so there's quite a few universities you might be able to you know uh, look up online that provide an executive or a diploma course online as well uh, remotely um i'm not too sure when you know things will come back to normal so i'm not 100% sure whether um you know um, looking at masters immediately could be a you know a, a criteria uh, but again i'll leave that choice to you i think um, like i said uh, a a few japanese universities are really good when it comes to robotics and ai um, in terms of the courses and exposure that they give you okay this question is on sports and robots how are the sport robots perceived in market today i'll actually tell you guys a story about uh, something that happened just very recently um if you guys follow uefa um in the last week or so there's a technology that uh, is used in soccer in cricket in all these sports which is called hokai um and hokai is essentially something that has 9 or 10 cameras that are placed at various points within the ground uh for any replays or any uh, you know third umpire related decisions hokai is used um typically you have number of cameras in place um to ensure that at least there are two or three different cameras that capture um the the information or or the video and 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 you know um, the umpires could be able to make that decision this is the first match that happened between aston villa and some other team i can't remember the name where um all those nine cameras that were a part of hokai were blocked uh, this is the first in 9000 games uh, through which hokai was used where all those 9000 nine cameras were blocked and nobody was able to make a decision they had to really make that decision on a fluke so there are controversial decisions plus there are you know useful decisions that these technologies or or ai have been able to make there are still limitations you can't really be 100% accurate when it comes to software robots or ai in sports um there are things still uh, still things which can go wrong for reasons you know that that are very unforeseen so so there's there's still a productive role that software robots or ai does play in uh, sports uh, but i think the acceptance of it will only come with time um, it it is more or less accepted now it's it's probably uh, at a place where majority of the sports are actually using that okay so i would like to end this q and a session with this last question from mohanisha where do you see ai technology headed in this pandemic situation and what applications can be implemented in real time scenarios um so with this pandemic specifically um and i i currently live in melbourne uh, so uh, what australia has done is they have taken the technology that singapore implemented for traceability um and created a mobile app for for tracing people who potentially might be infected uh, and who come within 6 feet of a person uh, so that 
um, you know, and it's using Bluetooth. So uh, think of it as something that is an extension of this technology again. So um, uh, very simply put, um, there can be, you know, huge amount of data that you can get through applications like this. Uh, you can get, um, you know, through tests that are being done through human behavior that's currently being exhibited across the whole world. There's similarities and differences. So AI can be something that can help you make sense and prepare you for similar situations in the future by using these data points uh, in terms of the triggers that have made that happen, what will really, uh, you know, um, uh, be possible for us to contain and to, you know, protect ourselves with all these, um, you know, pandemics or any, any other situation like this, which is very unforeseen and, and you know, unfortunate, something like this happens once in hundred years, most of the time. So I think uh, AI can really help you get those data points together, you know, look at those data points and really help you make decisions in the future that will enable you from, you know, preventing or, or at least acting in a better way uh, when it comes to such situations. Okay, over to Dr. Sanjay, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nishad, so for a very nice uh, talk webinar. In a very, uh, that means uh, short time, you give the idea about uh, software robots and how they can be used for the machine learning as well as attended and unattended robots. And then, if the prediction out of the classification task becomes more and more difficult, then how the machine learning will come in picture and the combination of the software robots and the machine learning will solve many, many issues. Uh, and as well as you have discussed in detail about the career opportunities. One important point uh, during this discussion was the learner uh, or the person in this uh, field, those who, are, who want to be specialized, they should uh, adapt themselves continuously uh, to learn the new technologies and definitely uh, the career. That means they will get many, many opportunities. So that is the main thing what you have uh, discussed and definitely the particip participants will get, a, get uh, that means they can plan their future in this direction. As well as uh, you have also discussed about how the natural language processing and chatbots, how they are also helping in the automation. So very detailed overview and in a very detailed question and answer session. Great, great, Nisha. Thank you. Thank as well as I also want to thank uh, from the Usha Mittal Institute of Technology to the Career uh, Center of the world. Uh, they have arranged a very nice session and uh, Sanjali Madam took a lot of effort in this uh, arrangement. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, sir. I think it's it's been great. I think um, this is probably the least we can do in, in times like this. So, so really happy that I was able to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Emails with e-certificates will be distributed to our participants shortly. With a single click, students can generate their e-certificates if they have 80% attendance for this session. So with your permission, I would like to end today's session. Thanks for joining with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.